He's Howard Ibach, a former copywriter and creative director and the author of two books on the creative brief. And he's Henry Gomez, an ad agency strategist with 28 years of experience. Together, Henry and I are the Brief Brothers. We love talking about creative briefs, briefing, and advertising. We're back for another episode, Henry. Today, we are in, in love. We, we, <laughs> we're, we, we have a, a, a return guest, TJ Bennett. I sound like I'm Barry White. I know I've got a little bit of a cold. But TJ Bennett is uh, returning. He came back. He came to join us about a year ago. Today, he's going to talk to us about something dear to his heart. He's offering training for creative leadership. Let's join the conversation. Yep. All right, Henry, we're back with another episode, and I'm really excited to, to invite back and to have back TJ Bennett. He was here about a year ago. He is the, the owner and founder and entrepreneur of, a, of an independent virtual shop called, oh my God, what's it called? The Pudding Factory. The Pudding Factory. <laughs> going, a little bl going blank here for a second. That's all right. Um, and, you know, what attracted, what connected me to TJ over a year ago and then brought, prompted us to invite him to our show was a conversation we struck up online on in, on the on LinkedIn about the creative brief. Yep. And it turns out that we've made TJ an honorary brief brother because of his passion for the brief. Uh, TJ sat through my online training and offered his, you know, some very kind uh, endorsement words for me, which I was for which I was truly grateful. And so we've stayed in touch and recently uh, TJ has been talking a lot and posting a lot on his uh, LinkedIn feed about offering training for creatives to make that leap from art director, copywriter to a leadership position, ACD or creative, creative brief or creative director. Mm -hmm. Now, Henry, you and I've talked about this before, so this is a, an important topic. So first, let me just say, welcome, TJ. We're glad to have you back. Yeah, great to be back, guys. And this is a really important topic because Henry and I have talked about this here and there. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about, we love talking about training. We love to talk about the fact that training, while it is emerging and coming back in some areas, it's still, we need a lot more of it. Yeah. And we need it, we need it from, from senior folks like us mm -hmm. to share with the, with the, the, the newbies in our business. Right. So before we dive in and, and hear more about what you're doing regarding this training, Remind our viewers a little bit about who you are, where you've come from, your background, so that we know, you know who is this podunk we picked up off the street here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see if I can uh, abuse people <laughs> of that notion. Um, I have uh, I started as a copywriter uh, many, many, many moons ago. I don't know, twenty eight years ago, I think now. Um, yeah, and eventually did make my way. I worked a bunch of agencies in New York and then in Southern California. Some um, major agencies too. We're not, yeah, we're not talking about uh, Yeah, Chiat, Ogilvy, Hill Holiday, uh, Weinar and Wonderman, um, God, and then Saatchi uh, out in LA. So maybe, yeah. Maybe we talked about this the first time. What years were you at Hill Holiday? I was at Hill Holiday like 07 through 09. And I was in the New York office, not the Boston office. So we were kind of the okay. the, uh, the little uh, stepchild. Well, <laughs> well we were, I was in the Miami Beach office okay. from 2004 to 2007. So we were really the little yeah. stepchild. <laughs> yeah. I hear that. Yeah. I mean, it was all good though. Um, yeah. And then I worked for some small shops too. So I think, and that actually rounded out my experience nicely to have the like, the big shop, big budget, big TV, big campaign stuff, and and then figuring out how to kind of lead that. And then the smaller agencies give you more of that entrepreneurial bent, right? You know, you're, you're working with, you know, you're really not just a creative director or an ECD or whatever. You're kind of like half new business person and, and half creative director, and there's more halves than there production should Production probably is production a lot more is in your, on your plate. Much more hands-on with production, much more... Um, you really get into all the stuff, all the, the, the traffic and project management stuff. You're yep. kind of like partnering with the one person who does that job in the agency. Yep. Yeah. Probably pitching a ton too. Oh my gosh. So much pitching, um, which is great. I think all those yeah. things are, are, are learning experiences. And I think, I think through that and through all of my experience, it led me to where I am now, which is, yeah, I still, I still do some freelance and consulting and all that kind of stuff in the ad world. And I'm still definitely like uh, 
contemplating what that magical ideal creative brief might look like. But I've, I've, I've also uh, leaned into coaching and, and helping people move, like you said, from I'm a doer, I'm a maker. And I've been like head down, like getting better and better at that and hearing the refrain of it's all about the work. It's all about the work my whole career. Right. And and helping people move from that mindset to like, yeah, the work, the end product is still going to matter. But there's a lot of stuff you need to learn to help people get to that space. It's no longer just you and you just kind of racking your brains to figure out how to write a slightly better headline. How do you get people to think differently? How do you get people to to recognize what really great work looks like? And then on the other side, how do you how do you manage sort of the political, cultural stuff that shows up at agencies? How do you deal with different political? kinds of personality? What? <laughs> I know, I know, I am, uh, I, I am, I must be exaggerating. No, well, I thought it was just all you know, sweetness and light, sunshine and, and roses. But, yeah, but it, it's interesting that you mentioned. So there's the politics, but there's also the business side, right? Oh yeah, and I think that it's easy for a young art director or, or copywriter to forget about the fact that this is a business. But the truth is the brilliant minds that we all revere from the creative river. Bill Birnbach was a businessman. Yeah. He's an incredible creative. Yeah. But what made him incredible was that he had a knack for business. He understood mm -hmm. business. And so I think we do our young creatives a disservice when we, I, I think that's why when you were talking about small agency, I was very fortunate that the first seven years of my ad career, I was at a small agency mm -hmm. where I was a jack of all trades. I got plugged into the production manager, got fired or quit. And then I was the production manager. Mm -hmm. And I learned that part. The art yeah. director called in sick and an ad needed to be resized. Well, guess who had to learn how to use Cork Express in yeah. a pinch? I did. But yeah. it all helped shape me. You know, I, I spent my time bookkeeping, you know, so mm -hmm. I got to understand, you know, what's the difference between, you know, gross billings and revenue and all of that mm -hmm. stuff that yeah. is at the end of the day, if you're going to be a creative director, an executive creator, a leader in the agency, a VP in an agency, you got to mm -hmm. have an idea of how the books work, right? Like how, yeah. how the money is made. How, um, yeah. Uh, you know, now, and it's, so isn't there a Absolutely. third element? And maybe you're, maybe you're getting to this, TJ. You said you've got to learn how to manage people. Mm -hmm. You've got to learn how to, to na navigate the politics. Yeah. Are, are you going to also talk about the, the sometimes horrendous part about being a creative director, and that's letting go of the work? Well, I thought we could probably touch on all of this, right? I mean, I think, you know, to, to kind of quickly touch on, Henry, the, the, the business part, for me, it was the, the small agency is where I really felt like I transitioned from being a creative and I had been a creative director, but like a truly understanding being, being a business person meant like, because you're as a creative director in an agency, I still think you're sort of oddly shielded and like the creatives don't want to know about the business side, da, 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 da. They just want to do great work. And to some degree, that's how it starts. And you feel that way, but at some point you hopefully get your eyes opened and realize the more I can learn about the business side and not just there's the, how do we keep the lights on and what really adds value here? And then there's the getting curious about the client business side too, and how does their business run and how can we solve problems for them and not just create cool creative ideas. So I think you get exposed to that a lot in a small agency. And I would, I would recommend for a lot of folks, if you can get a chance to gut yourself in a small agency, at least for some period of time, it's a pretty good training ground. Um, so I recommend that. Then coming back to, to what to what you're talking about, um, when you talk about like letting go of the work, you mean not doing the work anymore, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, like not I, being I, the person I, who solves the problem, who cracks it. it it's it's yeah. a, you know, it's a, it's the joy of being the, the problem solver is something that you, yeah. you can still do to some extent as a creative director. Yeah. But if you do it too much, Mm. You're gonna piss off your creatives. Oh, and, absolutely. And you're and you're not utilizing your people yeah. properly. Right. So I I I want to interrupt real quick because uh, many years ago I found I was for whatever reason I was dissatisfied with the creative director we had at the time, and I started like you know googling, and you know this was before like all the information sources we have now, but it was already right. in the age of the internet. 
and you know what makes for a good creative director and i wish i i probably have a document somewhere that i had mm -hmm. started that i've started like getting from different sources and i'll never forget that that one of the things was exactly that howard was the creative director shouldn't be doing the work but the hallmark of a good creative director is that in the bottom of the ninth inning down two runs yeah the creative director has to be able to pull the idea out of a hat that solves the brief step in. and you can yep. and step in and and do it it's not the optimal situation right like that's a, but mm -hmm. everybody feels better when the creative director is capable of generating sure. that high level idea and see through all the bullshit and see through all that and just say, look, here it is. This is what mm -hmm. we're going with. So I think one that more, there is a benefit thing, to that. There's one more thing to that, that really mm -hmm. good, in my opinion, and TJ, I want to hear what you have to say about this. The really yeah. good creative leaders are, are going to be able to do that, to pull that off and offer the solution that no one else seems to be able to get, mm -hmm. but not necessarily take credit for it. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's a great point because I think probably early in a creative directing career, you may want to take credit for it because mm -hmm. you, you're you still of the mindset of a creative and you're also kind of like trying to get a, maybe an attaboy as in this new role. But I think a really good CCO will give you more of an attaboy if you go, we did this work, we, we created it. The team really made it amazing. And I'm excited that we built this and, and using we language much more so than I language. I think you don't even necessarily need to mention it to your boss, the well, CCO. I, the I think that there's, you're, there's a subtle mind shift, right? From yeah. the, the, I won this award, right? Mm -hmm. As an art director or a copywriter to I won this award as a creative director. I didn't generate the idea, but I created right. the environment. I hired mm -hmm. this person. Yeah. I I gave them the feedback. And you have to be willing to be okay with that, to say, yeah. I'm personally okay with the amount of credit I'm going to get as the creative leader here. Right. Not because I generated the idea, but because I put all the things in place that yeah. were necessary to generate this idea. Yeah, so we, and we've got three cool areas here, TJ, mm -hmm. and and what what so we're we're just going to jump into okay. uh, what you're doing here. What what how are you going about offering this kind of coaching or training? What's what's the impetus for it? What's the criteria around it? Well, I mean, basically the way I the way I offer it is I'll talk to people within like an agency, and oftentimes they've got some you know up and coming creatives it could even be more established it doesn't have to be an up and coming i tend to deal a lot with folks who are kind of on their way up but i can work with with established folks too and it's really just about helping people to see all of what we just started talking about here like usually people are coming to me saying my creatives are great creatives my creative directors are great creatives they know and they they kind of know a great idea when they see it but they haven't developed the skills at coaxing more of that out of people, rewarding people appropriately so that they, they get excited, not taking credit, um, not jumping in too early with that ninth inning. They come in in the fifth because they freak out <laughs> and, they, and then they solve it. Um, and actually like there's a certain, as you were talking, Henry, I was like, there's a certain point, and I don't know if it happens automatically or if I learned it, but where the switch gets flipped and you get as excited or more excited when your team comes up with a killer idea than you ever did when you came up with one. And it's this combination of like, you know, almost like parental like pride of like, I'm like you said, creating the conditions, fostering the environment, like pulling in the right kinds of people to do this work with a little bit of recognition, like, hmm. I think I'm finally starting to get this thing. I'm finally starting to learn how to do this. And, and if you can start to extract joy from that, that's a really big deal. So things like that, like the mindset sh set shifts that you want to have happen as you move in, that's part of what, what we coach around as well is how can you, is that, is that teachable TJ? How, how do you teach I, that? I think so. I mean, I think, I think you just have to help people reframe a little bit. Think about what, what sort of geeks you out now, what gets you excited now. And, and then let's, let's, let's think about how that, that could transfer, you know, in this world 
like, what are you currently getting excited about as a creative director? And can you start to move more things into the, the creative director side of the excitement uh, equation versus the creative side of the excitement equation? I've worked with people and I've seen it where they're like, okay, I think I get it now. This, the, the, the aha moment happens and they realize I've already proven myself as a creative. Now this is a new challenge. I want to, to prove myself as a creative director. I need to learn how to, to, to find joy in some different things. Yeah. Can it? Uh, two, two quick things to react to, to what you said. The first is that mindset of being surprised and delighted by the great mm -hmm. ideas. That's something that as a strategist is like second nature to us because we're yeah. not the ones that, mm -hmm. but we're kind of setting up the brief. We're like, yeah. we're, we're, and then at a certain point, it, the, we turn the baby over to them. And then mm -hmm. when, what comes back, like it could be either very disappointing uh, or in a lot of cases, very exhilarating to see. Like, I never saw that coming. Wow, what yeah. a great, you know, and you can kind of, so for, so that, that was my first reaction. But the other is, Despite the fact, so despite the fact that there really isn't an organized kind of creative director, creative leadership training out there that people can, mm -hmm. you know, enroll in a university and learn this stuff or yeah. whatever, some people find their way to being great creative leaders, right? Like they, mm -hmm. they just either because they have more of a teaching sensibility mm -hmm. or they themselves had somebody teach them that taught them. Yeah. And for informally how to be a good creative director and frankly yeah. you can learn from bad ones too like i don't mm -hmm. want to be like that guy right yeah absolutely but it kind of is just left to the individual mm -hmm. to kind of um train themselves and say who do i admire in creative direction who don't i admire what do i what habits do i want to pick up and yeah. why i think there has to be a point in time where you have to self-realize like okay these are my weaknesses and i need to shore them up or mm -hmm. maybe not even a weakness this is a blank spot like this is yeah. just a gap just a blank that spot. I, I don't even realize what i don't know yeah but but i think the the first step is really to come to that hard-hitting realization of this job isn't like the other jobs i've had mm -hmm. this is a different job yeah. description that mm -hmm. requires a different side of me that I haven't really had to use up till now. Yeah. Um, and that, Oh, and this is other people are depending on me to do this the right way. Yeah. It, it, you bring up a couple of things that, that connect to the way I'm starting to think about this. One is the way I think about coaching and training of anything. It's, it's like a fast forward button, right? So I could spend several years kind of mucking it up as a creative director, pulling from some people that I liked or didn't like, getting beat up for things that I don't know. And then I learn. And so over a period of a few years, and this is probably how it worked for me. And for a lot of us, I start to become a pretty decent creative director. Now you, you as an agency, you could accept that, but wouldn't you rather find a way to get people from, from A to B much quicker. And I think that takes a little bit more of an engaged approach and not just a let's just see how the chips fall as this person gets kind of like punched in the face a few times by the job. And I think it actually starts with when you promote somebody, do they want the damn job? Because I think there's a lot of people who get promoted to creative director because I, I need to pay you more. And so I, I promote you to creative director. You're so good. And I think, you know, again, this comes back to how, how knowing how business runs. If you really thought about it, having some exceptional creatives on your team who become sort of more lead by example, but they don't lead people uh, and they become sort of, I don't know how you'd call them, but like uh, sort of mentor creatives, maybe there, there's some value in that, that I think could be worth paying them more without putting the people leadership side onto them. Because a lot of people don't want to be people leaders. So have the conversation with people about where do you want to go? And then if somebody says, I think I want to lead people. I like it. I've done it a little on projects. Okay. Now you can start to talk to them. About, well, what is that going to look like for you? This is a very different career. This, there are very different measurements of what it means to be good. And ultimately, you know, you can start to get self-aware. That's the key. Cause you were kind of talking about that or alluding to that, Henry. It's like, yeah, yeah. self-awareness comes, but it takes a while. Yeah. And I so like, no, go so, ahead. Super interesting what you were saying. I don't. I don't think I've ever heard of a case where uh, 
a senior art director or senior copywriter gets promoted to ACD where the promoting person sits down with them and says, here's your brand new job description. The same way that you would use if we were hiring, right? In ACD, there's a job description that says you got to do this, this, this. I've never heard of a case like where I'm promoting you to ACD. By the way, here's your new job description. Take a look at how it differs from your old job description. That, I mean, right Mm -hmm. there would like open. I say, oh, now I get it. Like this is a different animal. That, mm-hmm. that, that it's, it's, that we're in some about. in some ways it's an awful lot like some people who learn how to write a creative brief by copying the brief of their boss yeah so you learn how to be an acd or a creative director by looking at your boss yeah and saying well this is what she does that i like mm-hmm. and what she does that i don't like and so i'm going to focus on the likes and dim- diminish or minimize the dislikes yeah like i think it comes down to me if i'm understanding you correctly tj are you saying they're suggesting that there are two different kinds of creative leaders. The one, those who lead by example and those who actually people manage. I think there should be. And I, I think every once in a while, you'll be at an agency where it's maybe not formally that way, but you maybe have a couple of sort of superstar creatives who are, who are not really leading people and they're just getting paid a boatload of money. Maybe they do have a creative director title, but they're not really leading people. And they, they gave them the title so they could justify the, the multiple zeros on the paycheck. But I think it could be more formalized where there's more of a track for creative leadership by example. And you can become a resource. You can be somebody who people go to. I want to get better at, at writing. I want to get better at my craft. And, and, but you're not dealing with all of that interaction between team stuff and the, the people, uh, you know, they're who, doing, they're doing the work. They're still doing the they're work. Still they're doing the work. You, and then you have yeah, a difficult we, brief. You want to crack, you give it to the give it to that. team that th- these yeah. guys are, they they know what they, have you ever heard i this is a expression i just recently became aware of and i'm pardon the gendered language you know about alpha males right sure. have you heard of yeah. something called a sigma male no like a, a sigma male is like this is supposedly um it's uh a person like in a corporate organization who's more of a lone wolf mm-hmm. uh, type of person not necessarily that political person but a person right. that likes to work alone high level thinker people mm-hmm. do admire him um kind of like couldn't be a mentor but not really into the whole organizational bureaucracy and, yeah. uh, and all of that and as you were talking that's what i was kind of thinking about yeah. was, like this is a person who does it so maybe that's something that you can look into there's a lot yeah. of ton of stuff on the internet about sigma males but i think the phenomenon exists right it, i it, think it does but not not as formally and yeah. and therefore i think a lot of people presume i have to go with the track that i know which is okay i'm going to go to acd and then cd and then maybe keep climbing the ladder if that's what what shows up for me but they maybe never wanted it. And some yeah. people maybe wanted it, but then, like you said, like we've been saying, they have no idea how to do it. And I don't know. I think I was saying before the call, I can remember one like two hour leadership little workshop I was a part of my whole advertising career. And I think my sense is maybe folks outside the creative department have gotten a little more, but I don't know. Um, but I just think there's this weird conception that creatives are such a unique beast and to some degree there's truth there that they don't want to learn the people stuff they don't want to learn the business stuff they need to be protected um that there's this weird bubble around the creative team sometimes that then says we're not gonna think of them the same way we might think of other folks who might at least get some training or get invited to certain programs or get a chance to work with a coach um I just never saw that in my experience. My my sense is that the time you learn about your abilities or lack thereof is Mm -hmm. at the annual review. Yeah. If if you've heard from, if the direct reports have have done their, what do they call that? The 360, I I haven't had a review in so long. I don't even know what they're called anymore. Yeah. The 360, you're going to hear from your direct reports. They're going to say, oh yeah, I get some good feedback. He's a great mentor or he sucks. He never talks to me. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. When I was when I was working at Team One, advertising, Tom Cordner was the creative director there, and he was uh-huh. the he was that mix. He was the a little bit of the of the um, of the um, <clears throat> the prima donna, mm-hmm. 
uh, along with he had some good he had some good skill some amazing skills at coming in at the ninth inning and solving a problem and not necessarily taking credit for it yeah so you could you could congratulate him for that lack mm -hmm. of ego and then he had another part of his ego that just you know look out but I also recall working, I also recall knowing a couple of ACD teams, art director, copywriter teams, mm -hmm. where one personality, the art director, I'm thinking of a team, I'm not going to name who they were, because they're, they're both, they're still both in the business. Mm -hmm. And they were both extraordinarily talented. Yeah. And one of them was a quiet art director who just liked to do the work. Mm -hmm. And he did some extraordinary work. Yeah. And he had a great symbiotic relationship with his partner, like a, like you call them an old married couple, which is what you, you know, you agree. I, th I think that's that's one of the things that creatives focus on. If the, the relationship they need to really polish and master is working with their partner, their art director, mm -hmm. their copywriter partner. That's yeah. it's focus on the work, learn my craft, learn how to pitch, how to sell my boss. And then mm -hmm. I, I have a new partner. How do I get along with my partner? Right. And then on, on the other hand, this the copywriter of this ACD team that I worked with and I knew became friends with was far more outgoing, very mm -hmm. gregarious. Yeah. Very. I mean, he could think of lines just like that. He could he could do he could solve the problem. The first inning, the eighth inning, whatever mm -hmm. you, you could always if something was going wrong, you could always count on him to, to solve the problem. Yeah. I don't have a single clue. To say whether or not he was a good creative leader. Except mm. that I, admi I admired him. Yeah. His creative talent. He was gregarious. He was charismatic. He he presented very well. Yeah. But I never worked directly for him. So I don't know. Would he have been a good? So yeah. I guess this is leading up to the question. Not everybody's cut out to be a creative director. No, no. We've all, we've all experienced people who have been ascended to the role of creative director who were mm -hmm. great creatives and sucked as being a creative director. Absolutely. And maybe they don't even know it. And you I, know and what's, I think you know what's a good tell is is if a, if a creative director is teaching at like the ad school or at a, yeah. a, if they're doing that, it's probably because they're they understand the part of the. So I, I am mm -hmm. going to name names because this is a positive one. Uh, one of the yeah. best creative directors I ever worked with is a guy named Jorge Murillo. Um, mm -hmm. He's still in at DDB here in Miami. Um, and he, he had his, he would, he would hire young creatives and he would mentor them and, 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 and show them the way. And at a certain point we were in the building where we were, we were running out of space. So the agency leased some extra space, like on the top floor of the building. Mm -hmm. And it was funny cause he went up there and him and his team of young creatives were up there. And a, a couple of times I had to go up there for meetings and one time I was down on our floor and I don't remember who I was commenting to, but I remember saying, you know, he's running a different agency up there. And, and, uh, and the person looked at me and laughed and I said, you know what? They're better than we are. Like he's, they have, they have a better, they're running a better creative department up there than we are here on the main floor. And it's because of him. Yeah. So um, it makes all the difference in the world, really. It does. And I, I think first off, it should be okay to not want to be a creative director. Yeah. But, but you then need to create some growth paths for people so that they can, you know, make a little more money and feel like they're developing because you don't want to have people just feel like they're stagnant. So we need to think about what that path looks like. I've got some thoughts, but I don't think it's fully fleshed out yet. But the, the sort of expert path or lead by example path, I think it's, I think it could be there. And then, you know, as a creative director, you know, when you talk about, you know, your, your colleague who, who was so great, I mean, so much of it is, finding joy in the, in the relational side of it, you know, and, and, and not, you know, the, the combination of the one-on-one -on -one relationships with the team, but also like finding joy and helping people to work together really well. I know for me, when I felt like I was at my best as a creative director, like the team is almost like, I, it's almost, it's, it's weird. It's almost like odd, but you almost feel like I'm barely needed here. <laughs> like, like you've set the conditions where, People know how to collaborate. They know who's got the right kinds of strengths on their team. So it's like, I need help with this kind of problem. I'm going to go talk to Susie. I need help with this kind of problem. I'm going to go talk to Steve. Or I don't know what kind of help I need. So we need to pull the whole team together on in, in a room or on a Zoom and, and hash it out and see who can pull it together. But for me, there's a lot of joy in seeing the team gel and trust each other. And that's, you know... 
it's not easy to create those conditions, but and I it think- it requires a degree of, of maturity too, I think. It does, I think it's maturity. I think there's a, a point of, you never, this is advertising, we're not getting rid of our egos, but there's a point of <laughs> quieting our ego a little bit, getting out or of the way a little bit. Or, or frankly, channeling it in a different direction. Like, right. yeah. why can't you get that ego boost from, from, the, that. from the stuff that your subordinates that you hired and trained? Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, that's really the way to cha channel the ego and say, yeah. yeah, this is all this. I'm master of all I survey, right? Like, I, <laughs> you know, yeah, but no, some people I... just can't get outside of their own head to, to, yeah. to get there. And to your point, some people have never really been given the option to be anything other than a creative director. The great creative does not necessarily equal a great creative director. And that was yeah. a discovery I made early on in, in my strategy life. I mean, yeah. how, how many how many of us can recall the 55 year old copywriter or senior copywriter who had no ambition to be the creative director but yeah. loved doing the work i i think i've known one in my career i've known a couple and and this is the challenge right because when i think of them i always remember being a little sad like that that poor sad person in the corner who gets stuck like in the cube by the bathroom because they're like at the tail end of their career as opposed to reframing it and 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 getting people excited about the fact that we've got these people in the house who are super talented they're not going to be the ones necessarily leading the pitch they're not going to be the ones necessarily managing this team of 10 creatives but if you have very specific questions about craft there there's a reason why that person is not sitting by the bathroom but is sitting in a prime spot and has people popping by you know once in a while because they've got wisdom to and share. They're the ones that knock out a brief quickly. They don't waste yeah, a ton yeah. of time going down, yeah. coming up with ideas that are never going to get produced. They're not yeah. realistic. They're, yeah. they, they, they recognize the client, the client's appetite, you know, all of these, the, the creative realm is so interesting because there's so many opportunities for mismatches, right? Of expectations mm -hmm. between yeah. the agency and the client. And by the way, that it's a fun, like I've always said, there's, there should be a moment after which an agency is hired or even during the pitch mm -hmm. at which the, the agency and the client sit down and the agency asks the client, what are your beliefs about creativity? Mm. Right. What, it, what is, what is the role of creativity to you and, and, and in your brand so that we avoid these mismatches, like where we're overshooting like yeah. anything that you would ever buy, because that's mm -hmm. not the way you see the role of creativity. And yeah. we, just, we just are too shy about having this conversation about the very thing that we do, work that we produce. It's, it's yeah. incredibly absurd. Like, like, yeah. do you admire the work of Wyden and Kennedy or mm -hmm. back in the day, Crispin Porter and Bogusky. No, right. I don't. I admire more the work of the Martin Agency because mm -hmm. of X, Y, and Z yeah. thing. Or you know, Old that's a conversation. That's a conversation that should be had. And by the way, there's different agencies for different flavors, right? There's different strokes for different folks. Well, that's but we never I mean, have that conversation. That's also assuming that the people you of whom you're asking the question know the difference between the Martin Agency well, and you know, Crispin Porter and Shyad and all these other, you know, the, the boutiques and then the, yeah. you know, the foot cones and the Leo Burnett's who just, you know, they're, they're right. solid. They're, Is that I, an I, opportunity I, for a creative director, right? I mean, a good creative leader could help people if they don't know that you could start opening the door to that conversation. Be empowered. Surely watched, they should be empowered. You've watched advertising, right? Surely you've you've seen stuff that you like. I could start to give you a sense of like the differences between those things. That can really pull out that teacher mindset of you, right? Where, okay, here's an example of some wide widen stuff. Here's an example of some shyad stuff. Here's an example of some gray stuff. And here's an, like, and you'd like to hope that some percentage of your clients maybe have a little inkling, but I think you could coach them up, and and at least start to hear. Oh, I really like it when creative does this. So the challenge I also wonder about though, is do agencies not want to hear the answer? Are they afraid to hear the answer? Because one, if I you're think like- that's why we're not having the conversation. It could yeah. be, I don't, because it might be like, oh, I really like what Gray does. And then somebody's like, oh shit, I don't want to do what Gray does. Or we don't have people who do what Gray does. Yeah. yeah. 
you know, I, like I, I agree completely. And the yeah. other thing is, I, I think that agencies are reluctant to unleash their creative directors on clients to have yeah. that one on like to, to yeah. have that one on one rapport. Like, the, I think the account yeah. people are very zealously guard their relationship <laughs> with with clients. Yeah. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll play sort of devil's advocate there to say at times that might be reasonable. You know, not, not everybody is, is equipped as a creative director to have those conversations. But I think if you get to a place where you are really good at the craft of being a creative director, and I think that's even a, a term we might want to bring in here, like think of it as a craft, yeah. think of it as a way for you to use your creativity in a different way. Your creativity is around how people operate and think how creativity solves problems. You know, so you're, you're still using some of the, the fuel that got you there, but you're applying imagine, it to a different set of problems. Imagine know? if Lee Clow were not allowed to talk with Steve Jobs. Like, <laughs> yeah, nothing would have happened, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And I so, think, so, yeah, go ahead. So TJ, let's just, let's just say I'm a, I'm a young, youngish art or I'm a copywriter. So I'm, I, yeah. I started my career as a copywriter, became a creative director mm -hmm. and I, I, you know, there, there for the grace of God went I, and I, I figured it out. Now, my direct reports might have some unkind things to say about me after the fact, but mm -hmm. I haven't heard about it yet. What if I called you up or I sent you an email and say, TJ, I want to learn how to be I'm 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 like I'm I have an opportunity to apply for or I might be considered uh, for ACD or maybe creative director at my agency. There's an opening mm -hmm. and I want to apply for it, but I want to do something to show that I'm ready to do, to take on this responsibility. What could you do for me? Kind of mm. walk, walk, walk us through what you would offer or how you would go about structuring some kind of training without, without yeah. necessarily giving away all your inner insights. Right? <laughs> well, I think it's interesting because I think there's two ways that can show up. They can show up as an individual or it can show up from the company perspective. When it shows up from the company, a little, it's a little clearer because they'll be like, we want to promote this person, but there are three or four things I think they should work on. So you when do it's one more than another. Do you, do you do you work mostly do with both. companies? I do okay. both and probably pretty in equal measure right now. Um, but I think if it's with a company, you want to have a conversation with their leaders, whoever's thinking about promoting them and get really clear on where are their strengths right now, where are the gaps and 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 what would be an ideal result at the end of coaching where you feel like they've somehow closed those gaps. With individuals, you know, you got to really start with them being willing to be really curious about themselves, right? Are you willing to come in and kind of dig into to who you are and who you aren't yet and be okay with that? There's no failing grade if you show up to a coaching session and say, I don't really know how to help somebody get to a great idea when they're struggling in, in kind of mediocre land. I don't know how to do that. That's something you can talk about and you can start to tell them to dig in to their own experiences. What's worked for you? Who do you admire? Is there anybody out there? You know, one of the beauties of coaching is that it's not necessarily me trying to solve the problem for you. It's it's you tapping into your own creative energy to figure out the best resources for you to solve the problem. So I'm not necessarily going to tell you this is how you do it. Now I could, if you come down and just so please TJ, just tell me how you do it. Oh, well, here's how I did it. That's one way. Um, but I'd also recommend to people to get curious and talk to people. Like, don't presume that it's all just going to show up in your head. I go through LinkedIn. Call, call up you guys, call up other people who are, who have now established leaders in the industry and just have conversations out of pure curiosity. What, what, when you're at your best as a leader, what does that look like? When you're helping somebody get through a struggle, what does that look like for you? Like, I want to encourage people to, to be curious and creative first and foremost. And then if kind of like the ninth inning creative director, if you really need me to tell you something, I'll tell it to you, but I'm also going to couch it. Like this is one one former creative director's perspective. There's many ways you can lead. And then I also will work with certain like personality and other kinds of assessments, because a lot of times you can find your leadership style by knowing kind of what motivates you. Right. So um, there's a there's an assessment that if you're familiar with like Simon Sinek's work around like, you know, leading with your why, that mm -hmm. whole idea, there's an assessment I use that helps people discover their why. And there's a, a bunch of them, but there's super basic terms like 
Uh, your why is to challenge things. Your why is to come up with a better way to do things. My, my personal why is to make sense of things, to sort of solve complex problems and make sense of them. Uh, th there's people who like to simplify, people who like to um, clarify things. And when you, when you know that about yourself, and it, when I took this test, I'd already finished my career pretty much. I was like, well, yeah, that's why I always thought of myself as a creative problem solver. I, every brief is this like awesome problem that I get to spend time on. If you know that about yourself, then you can think about how do I lead using that strength? How do I take my problem solving skills and use it to, to help people solve problems rather than myself? So a lot of it is using tools to generate self-awareness that then tells you what are the strengths I have and what are the areas of interest that I have to, to bring to this creative director role. Um, I, I think there's never really a full like one size fits all, at least as I do it. But I think the common themes are <laughs> redirect or rethink your ego. Get, get comfortable with the fact that your presence is going to matter more. Your words are going to matter more. You have an impact as an ACD or a CD with the things you say and do that's very different than if you're a copywriter. And so how does that show up? Meaning, for example, the way you maybe interact with the account team. Maybe you've got a little feisty relationship right now and it leans towards like combative at times. Mm. Eh. As a copywriter, the account team? Oh, never. As a copywriter, that's like, that's okay. Yeah, it's yeah, fine. Yeah. It's not maybe not ideal, but but as an ACD now or a CD, you're now modeling something. You're now, you know, you're not showing everybody else on your team that the best way to do things is to just be an asshole with everybody. Rather than you know what, I, I'm going to, I'm going to be collaborative with people. I'm going to be firm when I disagree, but I'm going to be kind and I'm going to listen to that other person. Those are things you can get away with not doing as a copywriter or an art director. You can't really get away with them. I mean, you can, but it's not good for the business. So that I think is really important. Um, and then kind of what we talked about, figuring out how to, to find joy in the team's success more so than your own creative success. Get excited about the fact that you pulled pulled it all together rather than did the project. You yeah, know? What, I'm, what I'm hearing is that the, the, many of the key essential qualities of a good creative are just as important to, for, doing, for doing creative direction as they are for doing the creative. Be curious. I, yes. I've, never known, I've never known any creative who, who lacked curiosity. Yeah. If you don't have any curiosity about the world, man, you need to find another line of work. Right? Yeah. And you need it's to listen, just... listen, you know, Henry, I'm thinking back, Henry, to the first episode we did, the very first yeah. episode where we said, well, what are the, what are the qualities that make a good creative brief writer? And you said writer. And I said, uh, you have to be a good listener mm, and not just yeah. listening with your eyes, listening with your ears, but listening with your eyes, pay attention, yeah. see what people are doing. Mm -hmm. People meaning the customer. Yeah. And that helps you write a better brief. So this is the same thing. How do you read your creatives? Yeah. How do you read their body language and interpret their body language in a way that can allow you to guide them. Yeah. You know, I, I like to teach using the Socratic method, mm -hmm. which is basically I trust the people to figure things out for themselves by me yeah. asking. You say, well, I think it's this. I say, okay, well, why do you think it's that? Yeah. Yeah, that's and very you, you actually the arrive. process. You, you arrive at your own answer. I'm just kind of prompting you. And if you kind of get off the track, I kind of nudge you back to the, into the, into the arena where we want to talk about it, but yeah. it's, it would be so much easier for me to say, do this, or this mm -hmm. is the answer, but no, I want you to find it. Because yeah. When you find it yourself, you uh, it, it sticks. Well, yeah, that's, 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 it's very similar to the coaching method that I learned. You know, you, you're asking questions way more than you're giving statements. Um, and as people learn on their own, and you're going to be a much better leader down the road. If you learned by experimenting, using your own creativity, using your own problem solving skills to figure it out with a little guidance, a little nudging, like you said, rather than if somebody just kind of keeps handing you all this stuff. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and you're also going to figure out doing it your way, right? Because if I tell you to do it my way, then you're going to creative direct that way down the road. And that might be a complete mismatch for how you're wired. Right. And so learn it your way, learn how to solve problems your way. And then I, I liked what you were saying, Howard and, and Henry, this kind of goes back to your comment about 
sort of channeling your ego in a different way. Like all the things that we have as a creative, they can serve us as a creative director, but you have to channel them to different places. And that's where it serves you. If you keep putting them in the same places, I get my ego served by solving the problem, you know, and I, I get juice from cracking the brief. You're not really a creative director yet, as far yeah. as I'm concerned, you know? So we're, um, I, I want to learn how to become a better creative director. Do I reach out to you through the Pudding Factory? Do you have a separate, tell me about this. How, how do I reach you? Yeah. I mean, there's a few ways to reach me. I mean, I, LinkedIn is usually the easiest way for people to find me and reach me. And you can find me just at TJ Bennett or uh, the Pudding Factory is there too. But I do have the puddingfactory.net is my website and you can contact me through there. And, you know, I usually set up just a like a 30 minute discovery call with people so you can tell me like these are the things i'm worried about these are the things i i don't think i know yet or that i want to know or i'm concerned about and here's where i want to go and then okay we'll we'll craft a program that will move you from where you are now to where you want to be in x amount of time usually three months six months something like that you can make some progress um so that's how i've been setting it up for now for sure well i, I henry i think we've got somebody who's leading the the uh, the the rest of us down a path that that hasn't really been blazed you're kind of blazing the trail i think yep. is what they say there's just that yeah. there's there's just nothing like this out there very little as we both acknowledge so i i say kudos to you my friend tj for yeah. for, for taking this on and i i wish you much much success really i appreciate it and i want to i want to add just one last thing because it just struck me sure. you guys mentioned the notion that like a lot of times creative directors will just say no and not give you the why. Um, I think for me, I hated that just so damn much that I, I naturally evolved as a creative director to give people the why. But I think for a lot of people, you just accept that and you think, I guess that's how you help people by just saying, nope. No good. Come back. Oh, so, uh, so in other words, if I show you an idea for, you know, I've, I've got some yeah. concepts and you just say no without telling me why they're they're you know, w what can I do to make it better or no, I just don't yeah. like it. It's just not good enough. Sorry. No, that doesn't help anyone. Get back at help it. Anyone at all. No, yeah, it, I don't think it does. But I think it was it was a very common method of creative directing yeah. for a long time may still be. And um, I think it comes back to if you want if you want people to learn you got to give them something to point to. You don't solve it for them, but you say, you're playing in this area right now. I'm not sure that's working. So there's some other fertile ground over here. Go back to the brief. There's a few spots that I circled here that are potentially interesting, or you're in a really interesting area, but the way you're cracking it, it feels either very familiar or it feels like there's no like reach out and grab you moment in your idea yet. So think about ways to bring that into it. Think about the work that you love. What grabs you? What surprises you? What makes you feel like, oh my God, I've just gotten a new nugget of insight that I never had before. Give them that kind of feedback and they'll work. You're not solving it for them, but no, you're, no, no. you're yeah. steering them. You know? Yeah, it's like you, 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 this is where the Socratic method really comes in helpful. You yeah. say, I, I would say to someone who has some good ideas, but they're not great, say, yeah. well, be the client. What do you think the client's going to say about this one and this one and this one? Yeah. Yeah. And what's strong about this and what's weak about this? And how yeah. could you improve that? And mm -hmm. now that now the creators in, in their own head, trying to think like the client, which yeah. which may or may not be the best way to solve the problem, but at least we know that this is what we can anticipate. Yeah. So it's yeah. just it's getting them to think differently about it. Absolutely. So I've always been very respectful of the boundaries between my job as a strategist and the creative director. Mm -hmm. But there have been occasions where because the creative director was drowning in his own, like he was in this situation mm -hmm. where I would, you know, in a meeting, I would say this idea, I would basically give that feedback. I was, yeah. I was kind of a de facto backseat creative director saying, you know, this is a really interesting area that's on brief, how you're executing it. I don't. And, um, and so I was always very sensitive to whether this was going to be well received or not by the, but I always made it a point as a strategist, by the way, to 
get to really know the creatives I'm working with, creative directors I'm working with so that I can know like what gaps I might need to fill for them that their blind spots that, that they have. And I think some of the, in my mind, some of the most greatest work that I did was in that role kind of riding in the backseat with a creative director because yeah. guys simply didn't have the tools and yeah. it's not to say he was never going to have them or could never have them. But no. at that stage, wasn't there yet. we were, he, he, he wasn't, he wasn't doing it and the agency was in trouble mm-hmm. and we needed to deliver. And I was the new guy. I was the new strategist came in with a lot of bells and whistles. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he, was humble enough to let me ride shotgun with him. Right. Mm -hmm. And we turned it around, we turned it around together. And so um, I I think that that self-awareness and like, say, Hey, maybe I need a little bit of strategy help to help me figure out like what, why these ideas um, are good or likely to sell or from Mm -hmm. a consumer standpoint, make sense or don't make sense. Yeah. I mean, I think you're, you're touching on a, a thing where just like a little bit of coaching can get somebody from being defensive in that moment who the hell is this guy in the back seat who keeps chiming in to coaching people to be open, to be receptive, to want to have conversations with other people on the team, to get to know them well enough to know they're going to know this stuff. They're going to, I need them for that. I need this person more for that kind of stuff. And to, and to help them see that it's not a, it's not a value judgment on who you are or how you are as a creative director. It's simply the nature of, humanity really we need to work together to solve problems you know i'm I'm smiling because so much of our industry and the creative side right is this misconception that it is a judgment on us like they killed my idea they must hate me no maybe the idea just sucked and you're still great like you know like like, yeah this is our ego getting in the way and i think that the baseball analogy that's overused is a good one you know three out of ten you get a hit you're in the good. fucking Hall of Fame, right? Yeah. Like if you have yeah. a career 300 batting average, you're yeah. going to be in the Hall of Fame. So yeah. this is a low probability business, right? Like Absolutely. where, you know, the chance of hitting a home run is very infrequent. Um, mm-hmm. The chance of getting a base hit is more reasonable, but even that is depending on the client and the situation difficult. I think we need to separate ourselves from our work a little bit and say, this isn't a judgment on me. Like I'm entitled to have a bad day occasionally or whatever, or Mm -hmm. maybe they were right not to choose that idea. And again, I think introspection is a lot of what we've been talking about. It's so, it's so hard. I think partly because of the way we judge creatives, because it's, it's a portfolio driven thing. It's what have you done for me lately? So there's this pressure that I think we tend to put on ourselves. Like, Oh, I really thought this might be the thing. And now this person's telling me it's not the thing. Shit. Like, when am I going to get my next thing? Um, and I think if you can reframe it like you just did, you go, there's going to be plenty of bats. We, we get bats all the time, more so than ever right now in this business because there's so much work and there's so many different avenues for the work. Um, and your batting average is almost always going to be better if you embrace the partners that you work with and trust the people that you work with to, to know when to chime in and give you a little boost or a little like, Hey, this is good. That's not. And by the way, just like a big leaguer, if you swing for the fences every, at every pitch, you're going to strike out a lot to pull an old reference. in, And and you're going to, and you're going to, and you're going to end up in triple a, which is where all the sluggers that can't hit a curveball. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, remember what our friend Cam Cameron day said, and it's from, from one of his books, he said, you have to understand that sometimes the client just wants you to hit doubles. Yeah. There's, you know, there's a lot he, of awareness t- there too. He told the story about his son who was a copywriter somewhere. I forget where who called him up and said, dad, my, my boss or my client just loves puns. And I can't, mm-hmm. I don't want to write puns. And dad said, give her puns and she will love you. Right. So he cranked out puns for, you know, 20, 30 minutes. And that's exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you have to recognize that what the client is asking for is what she wants or he wants. And it's mm-hmm. not a bad thing because you're building a relationship. Yeah. That's, that's such a, a lost, you're not even really aware of that. I think when you're creative, like copywriter, art director, you're just so focused on the work must kill that yeah. the relationship building and even relationship building through work that maybe isn't your favorite 
but that's how trust starts to happen. They start to rely on you. And then you can crack that door a little bit more and you can go from hitting the single to the double, you know, hey, this is really fun, but what if we did it this way? Maybe it's a little less punny, but it's still got a little wordplay, but it's got a little more insight. In uh, each uh, understanding the personal motivations and biases mm -hmm. and tastes of client decision makers is an undervalued oh, yeah. commod commodity in our industry. Um, yeah. it, it's unbelievable to me because you know, in the end, this is all, it's, it's a relationship game, you know, yeah. and, and I, I've had clients like where I knew they just did not trust agencies in their mind. They had this mental block of you guys just want to do something to win a lion. I can yeah. you don't care about my bottom line numbers. You mm -hmm. want to go shoot in an exotic place. You yeah. want to like the, every distrust that he could have of an agency he had. And mm -hmm. I don't know that we can ne necessarily correct that, but yeah. certainly um, we needed to be aware of that. And well, I, I heard that 30 years ago when I was first starting out. So it's, mm -hmm. it hasn't changed. And we've, yeah. we've kind of morphed, we've kind of morphed onto a topic that creatives love to, to, um, you know, talk about, which is, you know, client relationships. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just want to bring us back to what you're doing, TJ, which I think is yeah. awesome. Um, Henry and I wish you the much, much success and TJ Bennett, owner of the pudding factory i remembered this time and an amazing creative director or creative leadership coach that you need to reach out to if you want to learn the insides the inside outs thank you for joining henry and me on the brief brothers thank you guys for having me this was a ton of fun i really appreciate it good stuff henry good stuff howard he's henry gomez and he's howard eibach and together we're the brief brothers till next, next time till next time bye-bye